Welcome to the Product Development Podcast, Episode 2. In this episode, I spoke with Michael Migliore, a lifetime value expert, all about customer lifetime value strategies in B2B. This episode was recorded back in May 2023 as audio only, but due to demand, I've put these episodes onto YouTube to access. In the future, there'll also be video format of some of these interviews, so make sure to like and subscribe to see more. I hope you enjoy this episode with Mike Migliore. Welcome to the Product Development Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Wakeling, a product manager passionate about enriching my own understanding of how great products are made. This podcast starts conversations with not only product managers, but stakeholders across the business to provide unique perspectives on the full product development process, from marketing and sales to engineering and leadership. You are my welcome guest on this journey as well, and I hope you get as much out of these conversations as I do. If you enjoy this episode, please make sure to give it a rating, review, and a follow on your preferred podcast platform, as well as share with your colleagues. It's really appreciated and helps ensure the future of this podcast. In this episode, I speak to Michael Migliore, an award-winning marketing leader and lifetime value expert who has worked with a variety of B2B and B2C organizations to drive revenue and growth. He was previously head of customer value at News UK, chief marketing officer at the Modular Analytics Company, and has worked with a number of other companies on their customer and product strategies. Mike, thank you very much for joining the podcast. Thanks for having me, Adam. Glad to be here. We've known each other for a a few years now. I must say, I've always wanted to pick your brains and have a sort of longer form conversation with you about some of your approaches and ideas. So I'm I'm very happy that we've managed to set this up. Me too. Yeah. And I always thought your your voice would be good on a podcast or radio. So it's nice to see see that come to fruition. (laughs) Thank you. Appreciate it. So I'd like to start this podcast with something um, I've been trying to articulate a bit in the past few weeks, which is coming up with a a short definition of what a great product is. And I'd like to get your thoughts on it. The way I see a great product is a scalable product with a unique value proposition that you can explain to someone in under 10 seconds, with the product being an essential part of a person's life, whether personal or business, and something that they would recommend to others. So taking that a very generic <laughs> kind of short statement, you know, what do you think is missing there? No, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think like when, when you said that, the first thing that came to mind was it solves a problem. That's mm-hmm. what I think a good product is. And I think you've, you've covered that off. Um, I love the addition of like, it's something that people would recommend. I, I can't, that's, that's pretty good, Adam. I mean, I suppose the, the challenge is the execution, of course. It's easy to say that in a succinct uh, paragraph, but actually implementation, which obviously we'll get onto, I think is a a whole, a whole different story. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that if you've done all that well, not that like good uh, execution always guarantees that you have a good product, but uh, I think good preparation with good execution can guarantee that you have a good product. Yeah. And I guess good preparation and execution can only come uh, from working well with other teams. So maybe drawing on some of your experiences that have worked well, you know, what does a great product and marketing relationship look like in a company? One thing immediately springs to mind, particularly in the SaaS space, um, is when I was at TMAC. And, um, you know, TMAC is a company that is focused on uh, customer experience products. So uh, primarily like in call centers, um, how do you improve the customer experience with say like speech analytics uh, and next best action modeling? And there was, I think what made the relationship with the product team and the CPO there work so well was like the preparation that we did uh, to bring those products to market. So there was a lot of I guess if you were to sum it up, it would be um, we were guided by data. You know, there's a, there's definitely a difference between being data driven and being guided by data. You can look at your data and, and do everything that it tells you to do um, and still come out with the wrong answer. And so I think you need to balance good data informed decision making with kind of what your expertise tells you as a marketer um, and work through that collaboratively with the product team or CPO in order to, to get to, to, to that kind of that, that end goal. Um, and I think that's what we did really well at TMAC, um, particularly on like the next best action product, which just because of my background in machine learning and marketing, I should say machine learning for marketing, since it's not me that's like creating these models. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think that's where that sort of, it all kind of came together in a really beautiful way. Mm. 
So how did you find the alignment on the data? Because obviously product teams often have quite different metrics in terms of KPIs, OKRs, yeah. et cetera, than the marketing team. So were you very aligned in terms of those? And yeah, I think, I think we were, I, th- I mean, I think that there's the differences is that, you know, we started with our audience and we thought about like, well, who are the end users of these products? Who are the decision makers around buying them? And like, what are the different types of benefits that we would need to surface like in sales conversations? Um, you know, in order to, in order to sell the products effectively. So one thing that I consistently do, like certainly from a lifetime value point of view, but also from a strategy point of view is work backwards from whatever our end goal is. Like, I think something I read a a while ago was like Amazon, they have taken the approach where they write a press release about the product that they want to build. And they, in the press release, they kind of outline like, well, what are the key things that you would you'd say to a reporter if you were bragging about this product. Mm. And I think that's a really useful way of kind of focusing the approach, uh, certainly with product teams as well. It allows you to kind of to work backwards and say, okay, well, wait a minute. So like we want to create a next best action model that is always giving, you know, kind of three recommendations per customer um, within across a variety of, you know, different product portfolio categories Mm. that kind of drives X outcome from a revenue point of view. Uh, and when you when you have a clear view of that, then it becomes it, it, in some ways it becomes it almost feels as though the product is creating itself. Yeah, I think also maybe in terms of actual implementation of a lot of the data collection touch points or the the infrastructure, maybe the marketing needs to lean on product as well in order to facilitate some of those things coming in. Yeah, there's a certain element of dependencies maybe backwards and forwards in that respect. Yeah, I I would say synergy to be honest mm-hmm. because I think. Classic, classic marketing is about product, place, price, and promotion. And product leaders these days, I think, in the same way that marketers have to be, you kind of have to wear several hats all at once. And I think marketing brings kind of this deep understanding of the customer and the market to the table, uh, while product, like, you know, the best product people I've worked with also have a sense of the customer as well. You know, and there's this sort of like dual, this sort of dual vision on who is it that we're building this product for that, that, that enables kind of the best outcomes. So extending the idea of best outcomes into lifetime value, when you're working with a company uh, and creating new LTV strategies from scratch, you know, is is there a framework that you leverage? Uh, What is your approach there? Does it differ from company to company? Um, There, there is a framework, I think, um, and, but it is it differs based on whether or not you're talking about a startup, a scale up or, you know, an established business. Ultimately, for me, it starts with what are the strategic objectives of the business? Because marketing needs to facilitate the delivery of those objectives. And so if it's, you know, acquire X million in MRR, like within 12 months, you know, great. Then that's that's kind of an easy one to take on board as marketing and say, okay, well, what does lifetime value look like for in order to achieve that kind of overarching objectives and like how many people is that and so forth. You know, it, it makes that kind of it makes the planning process a lot simpler. So I I start there, like normally speaking to the CEO um, or sometimes investors and say, you know, like where are we going with this? Because then it allows me to say, okay, well, how does marketing contribute to that? The, the next step is diving deep into, you know, the, the capabilities of the business. Like what, what is it good at? What is it not good at? It sounds like super, it sounds super cliche, but SWATs are mm-hmm. something that I return to time and time again, you know, because ultimately it doesn't make sense to put a strategy together that a company can't deliver. Uh, and so you need to understand actually what is this company good at? Where does it need work and how are those two things going to help facilitate what that overarching objective is? From there, it's about doing the, the numbers bit. So it's figuring out actually what does revenue need to look like? Or say, if we know what revenue needs to look like, what is that in terms of, in terms of volume and, and lifetime value? And, and working through that and looking at actually usually different scenarios as well to understand, well, in like the best case scenario, where do we end up and and how and, and how do we get there from from there it's about uh working backwards across 
what does, you know, what are the key levers, which is actually products and thinking, well, if we're working with product teams, if the product doesn't exist, I actually should hasten to add, by the way. Um, if it does exist, then happy days, you can kind of go straight into, you know, like what is the, the marketing strategy? But if it doesn't, then the, pr- the product strategy has to come first. And it has to, and you, you have to think about all the stuff we were just talking about. So like, you know, like it's getting, getting deep into the skin of who is the market for this product um, and what makes them tick? You know, like what is the core problem that this product needs to solve? All of which need to be in place before you kind of go into the level of marketing and thinking about who am I talking to? What am I going to say? How am I going to say it? And why are we doing this? Which I think if you had to sum up like marketing in one sentence, that would be that. So once you once you take a look at that, you you dig into these kind of deeper marketing questions and think about okay, well, where do I want to allocate? Where do I want to allocate my my spend? And and what is the right? What are the right channels to reach these kind of key decision makers? And indeed, if if applicable, end users, um, in, you know, because in a B two B environment, you're you have to you have to think about both, you know, and then you effectively go through what's what has always actually been an iterative process with kind of that first group of stakeholders that I mentioned, whether it's like the C-suite and or investors to, to kind of agree that way forward and and, um, and start executing. Mm. That's, that's it, in a, in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so assuming that you're at a company, they know where they want to go. They have the, the vision. Maybe they've mm-hmm. got a basic product in place. So you have something mm-hmm. to work with and a, a basic product um, roadmap and plan to work with to feed into the marketing plan. You mentioned the SWOT analysis. Maybe you can talk a bit about what goes into that. I mean, anyone can create a SWOT analysis, but in terms of the, mm-hmm. the data you're pulling, the research, the the stakeholders you speak to, um, what, what does that kind of process look like? Well, it's it's definitely about understanding the market in which they operate in. Um, to use TMAC as an example, just because they were B two B and SaaS, um, it's a highly competitive market. There are lots of providers out there that offer customer experience platforms and that are also specifically aimed at call centers. Um, and so for us, there was, there was this question about like, well, how do we, how do we, how do we build the product to challenge those, those existing players, uh, but also add something, something more and, and thinking about, okay, well, if we, if we if we go back to what we need to do that we probably need x number of um, product strategists we need you know x number of developers um, and and ultimately we need to make sure that uh, we are leveraging the the right resources internally to deliver those to deliver that outcome if, if I were going about and saying okay well how do we what what is what are the strengths of um, of the business? It's definitely speaking to stakeholders. It's thinking about how the business is performed in um, the the sort of immediate past, and also and also to be honest, getting a sense of where the C suite thinks it's going, like how how they expect it to perform, because it's um, it's a key piece of information that I think can influence how you how you as kind of a marketing leader interpret what you see in the business if that makes sense in terms of the opportunities and threats do you mm-hmm. consider competitive analysis quite a significant part of that because there are kind of multiple schools of thought on the role of competitors in product and marketing strategies and i suppose you've got things like the blue ocean strategy which is very much focused yeah. on you know where are your blue oceans defined amongst the uh, <laughs> the red oceans of competitors and <laughs> um i mean some, some people say ignore what your competitors do do your own thing what, what are your thoughts there yeah, I I'm a big advocate of understanding what currently exists in the market. I've I've never understood that the the approach of like oh, just do your own thing. I mean, to to a certain extent, it is necessary because there needs to be a strong vision on on you know like what is the product we're we're creating. But ultimately, you know, no company exists in a vacuum, um, and if companies act as though they do, I think they make. They they run the risk anyways of making um, poor choices. For example, you know there is no company on earth that is not that doesn't exist in one of the four kind of basic quadrants um, of competition that Michael Porter outlined in his book on on uh, competitive strategies. I, I want to say like in the seventies, but don't 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 fact check me on that. Um, where ultimately you're either competing on a a, a type of benefit. 
um, or price. Mm. And I think businesses need to be clear about where they fall in, in those four quadrants uh, before, taking, before taking a product to market. Um, and so when we're, when we're looking at um, you know, threats, Yes, I I agree. To, to 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 make a long story short, probably too late. I agree. Like you you do need to you do need to focus on what your competitors are doing, so that so that if no if for no other reason, you can figure out how to do it better or more cheaply. You make me think of Amazon in particular about a company that does something very well in terms of focusing on one part of their competitive elements. In this case, I'd say it's customer satisfaction, value. Uh, customer support and uh, obviously efficiency and speed of delivering stuff to people and less on price. And I think certainly from my perspective, I know I can get it cheaper elsewhere when I when I buy something on Amazon, but I still buy it on Amazon because of those reasons. So I, I'm very much aware of that as a, a good example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. And don't, don't get me wrong. Like, I think there are some businesses where price can work in the other way, where if you actually raise pricing, mm. um, it, it has uh, it has an impact on demand, and it's like inverse price elasticity or something. I can't remember the exact term for it. Um, but in essence, when it comes down to it, that business is still competing on price. So I, I think it's a even even with those types of inverse relationships, you still end up like basically falling into one of those four quadrants. And I've, I've never worked with a business that didn't. Mm. Price sensitivity, lifetime value. Where does that all come together for you? You know, what work do you do around the pricing side of things in, in your strategies? I think I think it starts with an understanding that human behavior is complex and nuanced, um, oftentimes far more complex and nuanced than um, some boards would like to admit. If you think about like fundamental like growth strategies around are we are we chasing value? Or are we chasing volume? You know, which which are like the two the two tensions that all businesses need to deal with. Um, I think it's it's very difficult to do both at the same time unless you have a nuanced understanding of lifetime value it's worth it's probably worth it just like saying for those who don't know that like because i because i see it a lot like people talk about lifetime value and they think they're talking about revenue but lifetime value is actually a profit metric um it's something that looks into the future and not the past you know the one that looks into the past is arpu um or average revenue per user and and so when we talk about lifetime value we are fundamentally talking about a predictive metric and one that can help strategists align uh, to 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 that future outcome. Um, so for example, if we take our kind of our imaginary business, that's this B2B SaaS company that's um, launching a product, you know, once we've kind of identified the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, um, we'd say, okay, well, if you really want to make, you know, a million in MMR, uh, that means you need either a hundred customers paying whatever a million is. <laughs> <laughs> Math is never my strong point, Adam. You need a uh, hundred customers paying, you know, 10,000 um, pounds or, you know, you need 10 customers paying a hundred thousand pounds. That, that's, this is where like the, the sort of uh, lifetime value, pr- like market information um, and uh, pricing becomes so important, mm. like where you can you can actually effectively set um, a price point or different price points for different types of consumer groups to get to that overall revenue number that you need. Mm. So, so two points on that. Actually. One part is what, what are the timeframes for that predictive looking at a lifetime value? Is it a year? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? You know, what is a what is a lifetime? It, <laughs> it, it depends on your business. It depends on your business. So like I've worked in businesses where the lifetime value is seven years, um, you know, and we're talking about that's, that's B2B and SaaS. Um, yeah. On the consumer side, I, you know, I've seen anywhere from two years to 10 years. Yeah. Well, what is the determining factor in, in, for the business in terms of that time frame? Or why, why would some pick two years instead of five years, for instance? It's usually the product uh, and existing customer purchase habits. Um, so, you know, if you're talking about retail or FMCG, um, you know, both very competitive markets, um, lots of alternatives. It's difficult for those businesses to compete on things other than price. And so the churn is very high. And, you know, usually your your lifetime value would therefore be 
um, the, the term that you'd want to think about lifetime value is is going to be shorter than um, say a B two B SaaS platform where you're talking about companies um, and uh, where you know contract negotiations can take months on months and you're probably uh, ending up signing like a three year deal with um, a technology provider just because it's more efficient mm. even if you're you know paying a slightly higher price. In terms of the actual pricing then as well, um, obviously you've established how long you want to get people on board in terms of that lifetime value, the actual number that you offer these different segments. I mean, I'm aware of a couple of different frameworks and approaches. I know Van Westendorp is one. I mean, is, is that applicable in terms of lifetime value? Are there any other frameworks you use in terms of establishing the, the right pricing? Yeah. So pricing I've always seen as a bit of a dark art, to be honest. It's extremely difficult to get right the first time. I've often resorted to like the simplest approach is, is usually the best one. I mean, certainly to start with, and if we're talking about like, you know, a hypothetical business that's trying to set pricing for the first time, it's actually just asking customers, you know, like how much would you be willing to pay for X and, and going from there. I mean, I, I think the, the most effective types of pricing is when you can properly do price, price elasticity modeling and you have a clear, a clear understanding of the impact on price on demand. But most startups don't have that. And it's a it is very much a sort of test and learn approach to to pricing. I mean, the, the great thing about particularly, you know, B2B and I suppose B2C companies these days in digital is that pricing can be both dynamic, but also can be very you can be very precise about what which price you show to certain groups. Um, not always, but the, like the, the opportunity is certainly there. So I think from that point of view, it makes it it makes it slightly easier to test and learn and come to a place where we can say, okay, well, this is the right price for our product. I always feel that when you ask the question to uh, users or customers, you know, how much are you willing to pay for this product? It's kind of like a product person asking um, a user, what feature do you want? <laughs> it's kind of, you don't, you, it feels like the wrong yeah, question yeah. to ask, you know, it's, it's kind of like we're trying to get the whys and the solutions underneath that. But um, in my head, I have that parallel to that for some reason. Well, don't get me wrong. Like, I mean, I, I once worked with a company where we asked that question and, you know, nobody, <laughs> everyone chooses the lower price, right? But that in itself is a valuable piece of information because it gives you a sense of what more do you need to do perhaps in um, marketing to prove out the value of your product and and ultimately help decrease that that sense of price sensitivity. You know, this is where, again, like lifetime value can be really, really influential because knowing knowing the end goal of a customer and actually how likely they are to get to you know x x and and uh, lifetime value or profit is it, it makes it much easier to say okay well we're willing to invest x in them now in order to get them to that place and potentially it means that on that journey we offer them progressively higher prices mm. on on the product something that we did at the times extremely effectively where we effectively move people up a ladder um there's basically a set pricing strategy like where we would move people bring people in on a discount and then move them up the ladder over time in terms of price to increase their lifetime value in terms of the discounting i suppose on the other side you could have to aggressive discounting, how do you go about finding the right discount percent? Is it the same process as trying to find the the right RRP as well? It's it's different for I mean like again like this is this is where like your knowledge of the market is really handy right like so I'm you know I'm currently working in FMCG where discounts are kind of par for the course where you can't get away like consumers just won't buy unless there is a discount and. That's beyond the company, right? Like that's part of this. That's part of the vertical itself. And so you've got to be able to navigate that and and end up and use use discounts to your advantage. Like use them in a in a strategic way rather than kind of using them tactically. Um, and so to use you know the current company I'm at, which is by the way B two C FMCG, it's it's understanding um, what are your competitors doing and what do you need to do to match them, but then ultimately figuring out where's the balance between deeper discount volume and revenue. Because obviously the lower the price you go, the higher volume you're going to get um, at, and a higher revenue number, but your average order value is going to decrease. And therefore, you know, if it's something you sustain over time, ARPU is going to decrease and therefore lifetime value will be lower. But potentially 
with that lower price, you may also be reducing churn in the long term, which also impacts lifetime value because it is contribution times tenure, less retention rate. Mm. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, I guess what I'm saying, Adam, is yes, it is the same approach. <laughs> 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 there is definitely a component. There is, I mean, for me, there is definitely a component of test and learn involved. Yeah, I think on the B two B side, which is my kind of area, mm-hmm. I, I think very differently in terms of B two C because B two C world for me is I'm, I'm a consumer, so my experience of pricing and discounting is very much from the lens of the user or the customer. And uh, yeah. there's certainly products I use uh, in the market across various industries, um, which I know that they tend to discount at least six to seven months of the year. So I'm consciously knowing that I'm not going to buy it until that very moment. I'm going to renew, even if I you know, cancel a subscription, wait a month and then renew when the discounts come. Again, I assume it's probably baked into the process of, well, these people are not even going to buy when there's a perceived discount. So we're just going to keep discounted probably 80% of the time. Yeah, I think, like I said, like there needs to be a strategy behind it. Like mm. some businesses will effectively be like always on discounts, but they'll build that into their price where they're still making a healthy margin, even with the discounts. I mean, other businesses, if you were talking about SaaS in particular, tiering is a, is a, is a great way of mitigating the impact of discounting. Mm. Um, but equally, I think B2B, you're not, you don't have to worry about it as much as you do on the consumer side. Like and I think that's the point you're making is like, I, there, there's also like much more control over price on B2B because you don't have to really advertise your price. Like that, that in itself is a strategic decision. If you do that in B2B, you could say like for on TMAC, for example, we, we never did that. We had a, we had a pricing strategy for uh, different sectors and depending on what sector you were in, you paid a different price per seat for, for the end user. So you know, if somebody asked for a discount, it's sort of like, okay, well, we can give you up to X, but we had all that. We had all that planned out and it was based on our modeling. Mm. I guess the emotional response to pricing is very different for a B2B purchase compared to B2C. Um, yeah, the drivers of value are very different in B2B. But this is what I mean about actually when you're when you have the right market information that's paired with the right audience information and a clear lifetime value from which to go after, the world is your oyster. It can be a much simpler process to test and learn and feel, I think, a lot less chaotic um, than it can be if you don't have that information. It doesn't mean that come, some companies don't get lucky, but I would personally, and I always advise my clients that like would much rather have a, a data-driven plan. Mm. You know. Okay, so you, you covered a number of areas. Um, and just to briefly summarize some of the points you were saying, obviously the importance of a data-driven plan. Um, utilizing segmentation-based pricing structures in B2B as well, being able to use levers such as not showing pricing straight away, um, which obviously with the B2C world you have to do. And you know, What are some other tactics out there that people can utilize and people listening might be able to employ into their own companies? So bear in mind that like, I'm, not, I'm not a pricing expert, right? but I do have a lot of experience in proposition design and monetization strategy. And I suppose what I would say to that is you probably need to know your different pricing models. Um, you know, the one I obviously have the most uh, experience with is subscriptions, which often is mistaken for a strategy, but in reality, it is a pricing model. It's not, it's, you know, it's, it's like a cost plus pricing or value-based pricing. It's, it's no different from that. So I guess I would say like continuing to, once you understand your market, you understand uh, your target customers, their problems, their desires, their feelings, um, the competitive set as well, which you know we've we've mentioned, it's it's really important to to have visibility of that, and then also um, with your costs in mind as well, you start you know throwing all of that into the the bubbling cauldron and start thinking about what pricing model is going to work best for your for your product. And I suppose like in the SaaS world, the one you see a lot is freemium. Right. Where you have, you know, you get a little bit of it, you get a little bit of it for free or you get some of it on a free trial. And then you, um, you know, you move into paying more for it over time. Uh, And then equally over time, businesses will price manage those customers. So, you know, step them up in price in order to increase uh, lifetime value and ultimately maximize it. So in terms of um, some of those tactics, in terms of once, let's say someone signs up to a, a a freemium version of your product. 
Um, you know, what does it look like from there in terms of, I don't know, marketing automations and in product experiences? You know, what are some ways to, I suppose, monetize those free people and get them to that point and then really drive that lifetime value um, sort of process into motion? Well, I think it, I think it underscores like what we were talking about um, a little while ago around like how actually pricing um, and products, they come together to form proposition and they have to be thought of, it has to be uh, considered deeply along with the customer's needs and wants, right? Because if you have, if you have all of that in mind, you can effectively go to market with something that is, has a much higher chance of success than something that you're, you know, sort of testing and learning through. I, and it's not to say that test and learn doesn't have its place because it is really important, um, even even on experimenting with price. But I think you set yourself up for success better by identifying the kinds of product features, you know, like it's, it, say you've got a, a news app, for example, and you want to save uh, and share articles, right? You, do, you don't need to make that available to everybody. You can make it available only to your paying subscribers. Mm. Um, whereas freemium still have access to, to the news itself or a limited amount of the news, um, but but not the full not the full product experience. You're saving that for you know your your paying customers, mm. um, and just just something as simple as that can make an enormous difference not only on um, revenue but also overall uh, churn in the long term. So, to, to, would you say marketing has much input into those kind of features that uh, drive lifetime value? Is it very much a product led? thing or is it a very marketing led to kind of come up with those ideas of what uh, ways to do those in products controversial yeah <laughs> <laughs> no i think i think they should i think marketing should have um certainly at a minimum visibility of those types of things mm-hmm. um but in the best case scenarios like for example you know the um when i was talking a little bit about our my experience at tmac as cmo and how we we, we purposely it works very closely with the chief product officer to design the experience and make sure that you know we were aligning to those 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 things I just mentioned you know making sure that we knew who our target customer was and and had a clear view of how were we going to monetize this product you can't do that without without those those um, with those two things being mutually exclusive unfortunately I do think in a lot of companies you have some forgive me for saying this, but you do have some very zealous product folk who will almost tell marketing as an afterthought that something is happening. And like that is, in my eyes, I just think that's mm. a recipe for disaster. On behalf of product managers, I apologize for that. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on behalf of marketers, I apologize because it's not, it's not all the blame is there, right? You know, mm. I mean, there's marketers are probably guilty of not being as communicative about overarching strategy. Um, and unfortunately, I think it's something you see more and more these days is that the kind of marketing is becoming less about strategy and more about execution. And that's not what it should be, you know? Yeah, I, th- I think there's actually a parallel to a number of product managers out there as well. I think a number of them feel like they're just stuck in feature factories and it's all about execution, writing user stories, getting the tickets through, hitting their quota. And um, that, that's what leadership want. But it also takes me back to where we were at the beginning of the podcast in terms of that product marketing relationship and the importance of alignment. And as we talked about, if you don't have that alignment and that good relationship, you're not going to create a great product. And obviously, as a result of that, um, likely going to impact things like lifetime value. Well, if you think about product, place, price, promotion, like the four P's that come into what makes what makes marketing strategy, you know, you can't. There's such a synergy between what the product is and how much you charge for it. And both of those two things are informed by the same piece of information, right? Your target market, their needs and wants, and to a certain extent, what the what the market is doing, like so what the competitors are doing. And so it's like such an obvious synergy where there's, I think, a lot of value left. Um, there's a lot of money just left on the table mm. and probably poor customer experiences because marketing and product don't work as effectively as they should together. Yeah, do you think it's a, a more of a symptom in smaller companies, SMEs, or is this very much a risk at larger companies as well? Um, it's, I, it's funny, you know, like I, so I've had experiences in some of the biggest global companies um, around and also some, some SMEs. I mean, obviously like I've been in startups and scale as well. And like, if what we're really talking about is like, 
communication, <laughs> then <Yeah. laughs> it's amazing. I think that's something that you see is like a thread across small and big companies. Um, I've worked for some small companies that have the same communication issues that big companies do. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure what to do about that. That's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a cultural it's a podcast thing. In itself, isn't um, it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely, it's beyond my, uh, it's beyond my pay grade, I think. But, but yeah, I think what, what, what you can do as a marketer to, and, and certainly for the, the, the products, people who are listening, you know, is take a certain level of personal responsibility and like find, um, find a buddy in the other team. Like I actually worked, um, when I was at News UK, we had a one plus one approach where I, I was paired as, as, as a marketing leader and strategist with somebody in products. And we worked together <laughs> to, 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 to help define, you know, like where the product was going and then in turn, how that informed some of our more commercial decisions. And so, you know, you, you don't need anybody to give you permission to do that. You can just, you can just do it. Yeah. I like that a lot, actually. Yeah, just cool. to, um, just to bring the conversation a bit back towards lifetime value. Um, an interesting area which we haven't really talked about yet is churn. Uh, so hmm. we alluded, it, uh, alluded to it earlier on. In, t- in terms of when you're approaching churn as a theme in its, in its own right, you know, what sort of things are you thinking about you know, from your marketing perspective and ways to minimize as much as possible the, the level of the churn? Well, I'm thinking a lot about um, the proposition. I think about how good is the product at doing what we say it does and how much are we charging for that? And ultimately what that comes down to is, does the customer see value in what it is we're offering? Um, I think when you dig into churn and you ask people like, why are you, why are you leaving? Why don't you use the product anymore? Um, Oftentimes you get a lot of different responses, um, but they all kind of boil down to that value, that basic value exchange. You know, for example, I think, you know, one of the, my my great kind of career success stories is around um, having the best churn rate of any News Corp business while I was there for like three years running. Um, and the only reason it stopped is because I left. <laughs> <laughs> Modesty, but, I must but, say. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but but that was ultimately like we would get a lot of we would get a lot of um people who would say, Oh, I don't have time to read the product anymore. Or mm. um, you know, I'm 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 no longer interested in this. And basically those are both proxies for for value, right? So and they're things that from a product point of view can be influenced. Um, and they that have nothing to do with like retention incentives um, or anything that's sort of like financially related. There's there's a real play there for product people to be able to be tuned in to what customers are saying about why they no longer see value in it and make a real impact on on the churn rate, which of course then influences lifetime value. The second point there is around what marketing chooses to highlight to the customer. So, you know. I've always said retention is sales. It's it's no different from selling uh, for the first time. And if anything, it's a lot harder because you have to resell to the same person, sometimes on a monthly basis. And so you need to be strategic about what you choose to highlight to the customer and, and help them fully get the most out of whatever the product is. Uh, and I think that's true across across all types of products. It's, 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 it's fundamentally something about churn that that I think companies can't crack until they understand that relationship between the value exchange and consumer behavior. It sounds very much expectation management in terms of this is what they think they've been sold and you need to make sure you're meeting that and that they realize that that need is being met and that value has actually been realized in, in the product they're using. Yeah, d- definitely. And there's, there's another role there for a product people to, you know, effectively not only explain um, features of a product, um, say like a SaaS uh, platform, um, but also make sure that marketing has the information that they need in order to create the right benefits. Um, And there's probably a role for alignment there around like, well, which benefit is the best one? And like marketing can inform that based on, you know, say the churn rate 
um, or acquisition rates um, or uh, upsell rate um, versus and 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 product people can come to the table with um, you know their own insights around it. Like, well, why why was this built in the first place? Like, what problem is it solving? In terms of the execution, because in my head, traditionally, you have marketing, I suppose, bringing people to the product, um, getting them to use it, initially getting that monetization. You know, once someone has entered that monetization funnel, uh, and it's kind of, the, I suppose you'd say, the product responsibility to keep them there, keep them happy, uh, meet the KPIs for the product um, as that user or customer. So where does marketing really fit in, in the execution in terms of churn specifically? You know, are you just doing ad hoc emails? Are you looking at um, their usage and trying to focus on usage in other areas that they may be underutilizing? Or, you know, what, what does that on the execution level kind of look like? So my approach has always been audience first um, and one of uh, behavior management. So it's ultimately about, because retention is in is in the past tense, right? So like when a customer has churned, the decision has already been made, like they no longer see value in the product. And so the responsibility for marketing is a proactive one for the most part. There, there is a reactive component in there, but we can we can talk about that in a moment. Um, proactivity in churn management is 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 like the, the way it needs to be done. So the role of marketing is to rearticulate the value consistently and differently so that consumers don't consider leaving in the first place. Once, you know, if that decision has been made, then that is when reactive uh, churn management comes into play. And this is where usually, um, you know, the best channel for that is, is a, um, if, it, if it can't be face-to-face, like in um, like a B2B sort of SaaS, um, then it needs to be some type of human interaction. It can't really be done by email. Mm. Ultimately, though, it does come back to that point about the product, like where like if the product isn't good, it doesn't matter how great your marketing is. It's just not it's not going to work. Yeah, it's made your job extremely tough, maybe impossible. Exactly. So the reactivation kind of uh, yeah theme that you alluded to there, what are some um, ideas and tactics around the, the kind of reactivation side of things? Uh, should someone uh, leave the product, whatever that product might be? Well, so uh, the first part of call is always one that involves no money. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, there's like in the B2B world, it's about actually rearticulating the value face to face and saying, well, you know, as a rem- you know, as a reminder, our platform does X, Y and Z. And this is valuable because, you know, another competition do it. Uh, we're the only ones that did it. We're the first people that did it, you know, did lots of different ways of kind of framing uh, the benefits of the product. And that's where like marketing can really add a lot of value, um, uh, you know, as long as they work together with product, right? Um, the next the next level down to that would be like, would be financial incentives. Um, but I suppose to circle back to lifetime value, it's where lifetime value can be really, really important on, well, actually what kind of incentive um, or how deep can do you go for this type of a customer? Because you can see given all the costs um, and given their projected uh, retention rate, um, how much is this customer worth to the business Mm -hmm. at a profit level, at a contribution margin level over their lifetime? So it it can help inform those those types of commercial decisions around, well, you know, we can give you a discount across, you know, X number of seats for X number of time, that sort of thing. So bringing all those uh, data points, I suppose, together in in some of the previous discussions, what was sort of a what, what metrics are you looking at um, in terms of lifetime value? Well, for it's it's the component parts of LTV. So it's about it's tracking first um, revenue and costs and how we get to contribution margin, uh, which is your starting number. Um, it's thinking about churn and making sure that we're running tests that are increasing our, our retention rate as opposed to driving it up. Equally understanding the impact impact of price, effectively proposition, so price and product on uh, on your churn rate. And there it's things like, you know, how are we acquiring customers week to week? How many are we losing? Effectively, what's our net growth number? Um, which are, I think, great proxies for certainly whether you've constructed your product well enough that the market is um, biting, um, but also, you know, whether or not your marketing is effectively working. 
uh, and whether consumers understand it. There's obviously there are better ways of understanding in a more granular way whether customers understand your marketing, but I think it's always important to look at that. The other thing is just looking at like average tenure and thinking how long do we expect to keep these customers for and ultimately making sure that that's going in the right direction. What are some common mistakes that you see by companies who are thinking about LTV or implementing strategies uh, in this area? Um, I think one big one that actually applies to both both B2B and B2C is forgetting about brand and the role that brand plays in driving lifetime value. So there's always a risk, I think, when you, the, the hardest part of, of, of identifying lifetime value is the cost part and figuring out actually what you put into costs uh, to get to your contribution margin. And this is a, what we might say is like an artistic choice <laughs> or like that, or, you know, a strategic choice around like, you know, do you add in um, what level of like marketing overheads do you add into that versus say like um, AMP, but like AMP budget. And I think that sometimes you make the mistake of not factoring in the role, like how much you spent on brand in order to acquire that customer um, and, and sustain and sustain their engagement because brand does play a role in both of those things. And obviously even though you, even though to get to your lifetime value metric, you're subtracting the cost of acquisition. You know, there's a real art in identifying, you know, how you're getting to that that CAC and um, and your and your overall costs. Earlier on, you reminded me of Amazon, and now I'm reminded of Apple in terms of that brand and obviously the power that plays for them. Um, I'm sure it's very difficult in terms of, as you said, attribution of all the branding efforts that they do uh, back to that lifetime value metric in particular. Yeah, one hundred percent. Like, I, I think it's, I, I, I think that some companies are obsessed with attribution in a really negative way. Like, there are there are some channels that you can attribute effectively to, and there are others that you. It's just really difficult, and brand is one of those. And I think it's important that lifetime value reflects not only your investment in brand from the point of view of costs, but also from the point of view of benefit. Like, brand is playing a role in driving revenue, and it's something that for me, as somebody who came from the you know, the customer marketing side of things didn't really kind of broaden out my experience until later in my career. You know, it wasn't until I was a marketing director and chief marketing officer before I realized, like, actually, just how important brand really is. I feel like theoretically I knew, but I didn't really know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And now when I'm working with businesses as a lifetime value expert, I'm always thinking about, well, actually, how are we accounting for brand in this? So AI is a very on-trend topic at the moment with the rise of ChatGPT and new AI companies launching every day. Uh, I think something like 2,000 new companies in the last 30 days, and uh, as we're speaking in April 2023 at this point. I mean, do, do you see AI as a huge value driver of efficiencies and um, other applications in, in the lifetime value area in particular? 100%, yeah. Like I, there's, there's huge applications for machine learning in marketing. I think... I'm not worried about it taking my job anytime soon um, or my teams. Like I, th I think the use of AI is about, it, it is precisely that it's about reducing time to market and about creating efficiencies, both from the point of view of how did this, how did this perform, but also how could we create things that are more relevant quicker and at scale? You know, when I created the um, machine learning engine with Google at news UK several years back, that was, it was all about driving efficiency, but also driving better outcomes for the customer because we would be more relevant. We would be saying the right thing. We'd be matching, you know, who we're talking to with what we need to say better and more effectively. So I'm a huge, I'm a huge advocate of the use of machine learning in, in marketing. Um, fundamentally, even if it's only for the type of kind of propensity modeling that has now become so common, it's absolutely necessary. I think it's, yeah, it's a really exciting area. Well, um, Mike, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to speak on this podcast. Yes, yeah, been really interesting. A, lo a lot of different things we covered and a lot of other things we, we could still cover. Um, and maybe another time we can go into some of those areas in a bit more detail. But the last thing I want to ask you, uh, I know that you are a big music fan and um, mm. a singer. It's keen to get your understanding, well, your view on whether that in itself is a, is a useful application into the business world. Do you find much value in you know, having these creative pursuits on the side and applying those to your business in whatever form that might be? 100%. Yeah, I can't. I'm so thankful every day that 
I chose to study music um, and not marketing. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think studying the arts and like, if you know, even more broadly, like if you're, you know, you're not in school or what have you, like having pursuits outside of work that really interest you is like a key way of kind of keeping sane really, you know, and, and making sure that you're balancing your work with your life. I, I find that it has consistently helped my training in music has consistently helped me think laterally about problems rather than linearly mm. um, and think and, and I sort of like apply different approaches to the business world. I, to, to do one metaphor that immediately springs to mind is like when talking about management and coaching team members on like what makes a good manager. I always say, think about conductors, you know, mm. conductor is not, micromanaging they're not playing the parts they're not sitting you know they're not playing the parts of the violin or the tuba or bass or whatever they are facilitating you know they're they're setting the scene to make sure that the players can do their parts and play them well and that they do things on time you know and that is just one kind of thing that kind of sprang to mind yeah i think it's so important Thank you so much for the, uh, your time. Where, where can people find you if they um, want to get in touch or uh, find out more what you do? Thanks for having me, Adam. It's been a pleasure. Um, and I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Take care. If you enjoy this episode, please make sure to give it a rating, review, and a follow on your preferred podcast platform, as well as share with your colleagues. It's really appreciated and helps ensure the future of this podcast.